I'm Sean Nichols with Battleborn Batteries. I'm Diane, and we're here at the van build party. <laughs> the enigmatic, enigmatic Nomadics van build party for 2018. We're very excited to be down here, meeting with some of our customers and talking to educate people about uh, lithium ion batteries and vans. Very beneficial resource. Two to three times the amount of power in the same amount of space as lead acid. Lasts over 5,000 cycles. And a 10 year warranty. <laughs> and a 10 year warranty designed and assembled in Nevada. With the Battleborn presentation. Just in the last few years, lithium batteries have kind of come onto the scene as deep cycle coach batteries, and sometimes the sticker shock of the price up front is misleading, and we think that they're more expensive than absorbed glass mat because of the price up front. But when we look at how many cycles you can get out of those batteries, it actually comes out cheaper. And so as we're moving into this, I think in a few years, everybody's just going to look at lithium batteries as their first option. And when I uh, hooked up with Sean here and talked to him and he agreed to come down, I was just over the moon that he was willing to give us a presentation. I put in a few Battleborn batteries on my own installs and I've never heard anything bad about them. They've got a great BMS system, which he's going to talk about. So let's give him and Diane a warm welcome and hear what he has to say. Hi, I'm Sean Nichols with Battleborn Batteries, and today we're going to try to give you a brief overview of how to use a lithium battery in a van build. Kind of crosses over to RVs too. And then we'll open it up for questions. I know you guys might have some questions. I think a few years ago, about five years ago, we started building these batteries out of my garage, and we kind of went full speed, and the, the Battleborn brand has become very popular in the van life, and also in RVs, and in boats now too. So over the years, we've had a lot of experience looking at different systems, how the components work together, uh, alternator charging, solar charge controllers, inverter chargers, all those types of things. And I think that um, our battery is most suited to be a drop-in replacement out of any of the other batteries in the industry. Uh, it's designed and assembled in Reno, Nevada. And the battery management system is proprietary to our battery. We're not using um, prismatic cells, we only use cylindrical cells, which actually cycle longer than prismatic cells. So we offer a 10-year warranty on our battery. It's an eight-year full replacement, plus two years uh, prorated purchase at a discount or repair the battery that you have. Uh, let's start at the front. So biggest question you always get is alternator charging. You can charge our batteries off an alternator, no problem. If you have more than three, we recommend you use our special battery isolation manager. Due to the fact that lithium has very little resistance inside of it, it charges very easily. So it'll take a lot of power off your alternator if you let it. We have a special isolator that charges 15 minutes on, 20 minutes off. That way you never risk overheating your alternator. The way we came up with the 15 minute number was to do some testing for an RV manufacturer. It takes about 15 minutes for the stator temperature of your alternator to heat up to the point where the efficiency of the alternator drops, which is where it starts to get hot. So we cut the charging off there. It takes about two minutes for the alternator to cool off. But we give it 20 just to be conservative because we don't want to shorten the lifespan of your alternator charging our batteries. If you have less than three batteries, you can use a regular battery isolation manager. Just a standard old Trombetta isolator. Uh, some people call it a relay or a solenoid. From there, you're looking at your other components for charging, the inverter charger. Does anybody here have an inverter charger? What kind do you have? What kind is it? Kise? Both of you have Kise? I know the guy that owns that company. So a guy named Lawrence Neal is a good guy. He used to work at Xantrex for a long time. Okay, so a Kise inverter charger, a Victron, Magnum, Xantrex, Ames, all those inverter chargers work great with our batteries. The reason why is we designed our battery management system to work on the same charging algorithm as an AGM battery. So what you're looking for is a 14.2 to 14.6 bulk and absorb with a 13.6 or lower float charge. Most components out there have that. With solar charge controllers, anybody here got solar? What kind of solar charge controller do you have? Morningstar, great. Ames, all right. Victron. I was waiting for someone to say they had a piece of equipment from Ames. I used, I used to be the vice president of Ames for seven years before I started this company. That's how I got my foot in the door in mobile power solutions. All those components work fine with our batteries too. As a matter of fact, we, um, you know, we, what we do differently at our company is we provide this knowledge out to customers about how the parts interact with lithium up front before you make the purchase. And we'll tell you how to set it up and 
sometimes even Diane writes blogs and guides and things like that on how to set those components up. So you're looking for the same thing, 14.2 to 14.6 bulk and absorb. On the solar charge controllers, we say 13.8 or lower on the float. So people can use the um, Go Power also because they're, uh, they're running 13.8 um, float on those, which are very popular in RVs. I'm sure someone out here must have a, a Go Power component, maybe. Yeah, I got a. There you go. Okay. All right. So f from there, you're looking. Does anyone here have a converter for charging instead of an inverter charger? All right. What kind of converter do you have? It's an iota. Iota? Perfect. That's an Arizona product. I don't even know if it works. I've never had to use it. All right. Well, it, it'll work fine charging our batteries. Uh, so will a WIFCO converter or a Progressive Dynamics. If you've got an RV, the chances are it could have came with that component in advance. So, that, you know, there's a, how about a battery monitor? Is anyone here using the battery monitor? For Bigtron? Bogart. Bogart. Okay, you got a Trimetric, Morningstar. All right, all those components work with our battery too. And that's why we say it's a drop-in replacement because we make it very simple to harness this technology. So, all right, so everybody always says uh, lithium batteries are expensive. How many people here have an iPhone? <laughs> Do you ever think you'd have a thousand dollar cell phone in your pocket? So our batteries are a little more expensive than a lead acid battery up front, but they actually last after 5,000 cycles in most use cases, you're gonna have 75 to 80% of the power left. If you cycle it every day for 10 years, it's 3,650 cycles. So I, and that's why we offer the 10-year warranty. It's really simple. If a lithium battery is producing the quality, if a company is producing a quality lithium battery, they shouldn't have a problem offering a 10-year warranty on it because the technology has far surpassed that time frame. Lithium iron phosphate was actually invented in the, in the, in the mid-90s at the University of Texas in Austin. And it took this long for it to get commercialized to the point where we can afford to use it. So it's, uh, there's, there are other lithium technologies out there that are coming to the forefront, but they won't be usable in this type of application for quite a while. And also another thing about lithium iron phosphate, which is a chemistry that we use, is uh, 3.2 volts per cell. So it's a 12.8 nominal voltage battery, which works great in our applications as far as a 12 volt vehicle goes. That way you don't have to change any of these other components that you've already invested in. The only difference is if you change the lithium, you can store two to three times the amount of power in the same amount of space. Do you want to know why you can do that? Okay. I'm going to try not to nerd out on you too much here. Let's see. So, has any, does anyone here know what the Pukert effect is? I've heard of it. I, I don't know. I tried to understand it, but... All right. Well, let me, let me just explain it in, in, in real, real basic terms. So, the thing in lead-acid batteries called the Pukert effect, which means the higher of a load you hit a battery with, the less actual usable power is inside of it. So, we did some testing on two 6-volt sure someone here uses six volt batteries, right? Okay, so six volts are pretty popular. They have a reputation for it lasting a little bit longer. So we did two six volt tests on a uh, 50 amp draw, which 50, 50 amps on a 12 volt system, 600 watts about. And uh, you can only get about 42 usable amp hours out of a 225 amp hour six volt bank before you got to the 11.8 voltage, which is where they say, this is your 50% line, don't go below this, or you'll exponentially reduce the cycles in the battery. So that's right, 42 usable amp hours on a brand new set of six volt batteries before you started to damage them out of 225. So they say you can use 50% of the battery, it's 50% of the power, but the part they leave out is that 50% is variable based on the load. On 30, a 30 amp draw, we were able to pull 70 amp hours out of the batteries. So we're almost to a third now, right? We're still not at 50%. On a 10 amp draw, we got 115 amp hours out of the battery bank on lead acid. So we're, now we're at 50%. If you're just pulling 120 watts, um, it's, you know, 120 watts is not very much. That's like a TV and a satellite box or something like that. It's not very much power at all. And uh, Lithium batteries are not affected by the Pukert effect at all. That means they can deliver you all their power, no problem. So at a 50 amp draw, a 30 amp draw, a 10 amp draw, you get 100 amp hours out of the battery every time. As a matter of fact, you know, we all know about the 20 hour rating, right? That's another, that's another lie let acid battery companies tell you. 
I'm not here to expose them or anything like that, just so you guys know. But, um, they tell you, you can you, they rate the battery in a 20 hour rate. I don't know anyone that discharges their batteries over 20 hours. I'm usually not awake that long normally, but uh, I think that you know lithium batteries, whether you pull the power out in 20 hours or one hour, you get the same amount of power. And that's why I say you can get two to three times the amount of, of usable power in the same amount of space. Because you can't, the Pukert effect doesn't affect lithium. So if you have 300 amp hours of power, you have 300 amp hours of usable power. Another thing about our batteries are that we don't deliver a battery to the market that's below 100 amp hours. And we know that because we assemble them all in-house. A lot of companies out there are selling like a 90, 95, maybe a 98. They don't know because they're importing the batteries from China. They're not, they don't have quality control in place to be able to know the exact capacity of that battery. Most of the batteries we deliver to the market are between 102 and 108 amp hours. So you're gonna get 100 amp hours out of them every time. Let's see what else. Go ahead, sir. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the drop-in batteries and then mentioned add-on charge, uh, uh, chargers, uh, converter chargers. I, I did get in lately. I bought a so-called drop-in lithium for my rig, and the factory said, yeah, all you got to do is install it. But, and I don't know if you covered this, but if you have a newer RV, I've got a 2017, and that converter it will not charge that lithium. I had to buy, because they do charge at higher rates, and I did have to buy an additional converter charger to charge my lithium in case the solar goes, the sun doesn't go out. Okay, so what, what kind of RV is it, the 2017? It's uh, outdoors. Outdoors, okay. Yeah, it came with the standard. Uh, Was it a WIFCO converter? Uh, yeah. Okay, so that converter um, goes to 13.6 most of the time. It sits there and it goes to a 13.2 like storage mode. And every once in a while, it boosts to 14.4, which is acceptable for our batteries. Um, he is, you don't necessarily have to change it, but it won't charge the battery as fast as possible or fully all the time. So unless you have a, like a large amount of solar on the roof, we would recommend um, you go with a progressive dynamic swap out on that. That way you can charge more rapidly. I feel like one of the benefits to having a lithium battery is the fact that you don't want to be plugged in, right? So you don't want to sit there for eight hours and wait for the battery to charge. You want to charge it up in two or three hours and be on your way. So it, you can upgrade the charging system, but there is no converter in the RV industry right now that will hurt our battery. So if someone wants to buy them and just see if the charger they have is working fine for them, they can leave it alone in the very beginning and then change it out later if they want to go faster. Yeah, I, I changed my, now I do have a thousand watts of solar on the roof with a 260 half hour lithium, but uh, that thing in the summer by 930 is about to charge. But we, we use about 80 to 100 amp hours of light, so yeah, these things charge up all the way. Right, you can charge a lithium battery like five times faster, like he's saying, so it's about five times faster than, than lead acid. A lead acid battery. Does anyone know what happens if you charge a lead acid battery faster than 20% of your capacity? Boil, and then what happens? Swells up. Can't remove it from the RV. It's like stuck in the rack. Um, you know, lithium battery. You can charge it up to five times faster. This is the one caveat that people kind of miss sometimes: is that discharging the battery fast, discharging it deeply, is not going to shorten the lifespan of the battery. Uh, recharging faster than 50% of your battery bank size will shorten your lifespan a little bit. That's one of the things that we always recommend. If you have 200 amp hours, don't charge faster than 100 amps. But you can discharge as fast as you want to and also as deeply as you want to every time. It will not shorten the lifespan of the battery. Any other questions? When you say deeply discharge, do you mean down near zero? Yeah, the RPMS is designed to give you the full 100 amp hours out before it shuts down. It's a good question that you brought up actually. Um, if you're in a unit that's like a towable or if you're not charging off your alternator, you're gonna wanna use a DC disconnect. It's one part that I should talk about here. We, we use one called a battery guard from Precision Circuits. It'll cut the loads off at about 12 volts. The reason why you wanna do that is um, if you have an inverter charger and a solar charge controller and you're not charging off your alternator, let's say it's a towable or you decided just not to tap into the vehicle system for recharging, you might think, okay, well, I'm good. I'll, if I run out of power, I'll just start my, my generator. Well, traditional inverter chargers and solar charge controllers need to technically see a battery in order to start charging. So when our BMS shuts off, the battery goes down below five volts. Just like if you run a lead acid battery down too far, you have to bring a conditioner out to uh, bring it up to an acceptable voltage to charge it. Um, the lithium battery just turns off. It actually turns off to protect itself. So 
Unless you apply a 12 volt source to the battery, you won't be able to recharge it. That's why it's important to use a DC disconnect or be connected to the alternator because as soon as you close that relay, it'll it'll wake the battery right up again. And there's another question back there. Yeah, there's a lot of companies out there that say that. I think it's because their battery management system isn't designed properly or they're using a balancing system. A lot of prismatic companies say that. You can only, um, and prismatic cells are usually quoted to last about 2,000 cycles. Um, the problem with a prismatic cell battery is that you only have four cells to spread all your, your load across. Um, our battery, the 100 amp hour, has 120 cells. So if I lose one of those cells, I'm not, I'll still have a 12 volt battery. If you lose a cell in a prismatic battery, you have a 9 volt battery. So I think that uh, on their battery management system, they do quote that 80% number, but we always quote 100 on ours. Anybody else got any questions? What's the battery like? Does your battery, like, you your battery, your car does battery, battery, battery? Hang on a second. How, what's the life of the battery? We offer a 10-year warranty on our battery, and we say after, in most cases, all the testing that we do is at a 1C rate. So after 3,000 cycles, does everyone know what a C rating is on a battery? So that means if a 1C rate means all the testing that we do, we charge the battery at 100 amp hours and discharge it at 100 amp hours. And after, after 3,000 cycles, we have about 75% of the power left. It's not really a feasible use case for most people are running at like a 0.2C rate. So they're going to see about 5,000 cycles. They'll have 75 to 80% of the power left, which is well over 10 years if you cycle it every day. There was another question here. Does the, does the BMS shut off the power when it gets below freezing? Will, Perfect. Will not accept Cold temperature charging protection. We were the first company to have that. Um, basically, our battery, if you're, if you're inside the coach gets below 25 degrees, the battery won't take a charge. That's to protect itself from something called lithium plating, which will significantly shorten the lifespan of a battery. It'll start to take a charge again after it gets up above 32. So we just, just keep the battery above 32. I don't think we're asking for much there on that. Uh, especially if it's in your living quarters. But I think uh, another thing to keep in mind is it will discharge also still. It just won't take a charge. And then the upper end cutoff is at 135, 140 degrees. And that's built into the battery? It's built into the battery management system. Yeah, there's a thermistor inside that monitors the internal temperature of the cells. Me? Yes? I've got a, a Victron charge controller. Yes. And it has all the different... Uh, types of batteries that you can set the little the little ro rotating switch you know to, to, to choose one of them is lithium battery should I go ahead and choose that or should I choose AGM because you say it's a drop-in replacement it depends on how the how the settings are on that particular algorithm okay. is it this must be a PWM controller it must be like no, it's an MPP. MPPT I'll bring you the, the list and you can tell me which I can look it up and tell you the model number after that I do a talk here I'll be happy to look at it Here's with you because the question is, if you want to run a microwave off the battery uh, bank, what size, what size battery do you, or how many batteries do you need? More based on the inverter, actually. Uh, each battery is capable of putting out 100 amps continuous, which is about 1,200 watts. So if you have a 1,500 watt inverter, which is what this gentleman's using, I believe, you'd need two batteries to power that continuously. Because the, the, um, the battery can surge to 200 amps for 30 seconds, but a microwave usually, uh, you probably want to run it more than 30 seconds. Most microwaves won't run properly unless it's a pure sign inverter. Most inverter chargers are pure sine wave these days too. What's the weight comparison between that and AGM? That's a good question. Our, uh, our 31 pound 100 amp hour battery is the power equivalent of 140 pounds of lead acid. So it's about one fifth the weight. Let's hear it for Sean and Diane for coming down from Battleborn. How about it?